Hey there, folks. So tonight I have a treat that is very special. Uh, so this is one of the uh, new, they're always new, as of the time of filming this, new backlight kit. Uh, to my understanding, they do not come with uh, screen lenses. Mine did due to a uh, specific problem that I will get more into later. Uh, but when you order one of these kits, this is what you get. This is one of the uh, drop-in backlight kits. Uh, I did do a video on one of these pretty recently, but I did the TV out version. Notably, I didn't do the TV out portion of that kit in the video. Uh, I will be making a separate video for that. Uh, but this is the same kit, just without TV. Oh. No TV version. TV version. Hmm. Well, who knows? Uh, maybe... Maybe it is no TV version. Anyway, um, it's basically the same as the TV version. Uh, you get the screen, the board, some wires to wire it up, which makes it not very drop-in, but there you have it. Um, there it is, okay. You get the uh, two ribbon cables for 40 pin and 32 pin Game Boy Advance consoles, some insulation film, uh, looks like adhesive for the positioning um, bracket thing? I don't know, whatever you wanna call it. You get these two little bits of laser cut acrylic. These are for positioning the screen within the shell. And then you get this, which is supposed to be pre-cut and uh, sized to hold the LCD in, but it looks like in my particular kit, I got just the center, which makes things a little bit more difficult, but we'll be able to work around that. Um, so in my particular case, I'm going to end up chopping this to bits and using it uh, manually, but there are instructions on the listing, uh, especially Retro Game Repair Shop, which is where I got this particular kit. They sent it to me to take a look at. Um, if this happens to you, I guess, you know, contact them, let them know what happens, and they'll they'll fix it for you. Um, but anyway, on their site, they have in the listing, they have the pictures and how to install this thing. Um, my last video, which I would normally reference people to, um, ended up getting the same adhesive thing, and I installed it totally wrong, but I guess that's a better example of what I'm going to do here. But anyway, that's what we get. Let's go ahead and get this set aside so I can start working on the install. I'm going to see if I can't just leave it on the desk. Now, on the other TV version kits, my understanding is they usually don't have this chip here, which I was going to try and uh, get the markings so I can uh, look up the specs on it later, look up a data sheet, but it is completely unmarked. So, who knows what it is. Anyway. Tonight's donor is going to be this wonderful, great condition Nintendo GBA, as is. Just a few years ago, I would have scoffed at this price, but I couldn't help myself for 30 bucks. Anyway, it's kind of gross, so I'll be reshelling it, but otherwise, it works just fine. They always do. Grab me some baterias. And normally for consoles that take double A, I'm using these Jugies um, because the charger is right next to my desk and I know they're charged. But normally I'd recommend uh, nickel metal hydride batteries. Better bang for the buck on double A systems. Uh, where is... Same game I usually test with. And... Of course it works just fine. I've already been through this 
off camera at the very least, but let's go ahead and get this thing torn down. Power testing and I will be reshelling this um, like I said because this one's pretty gross but my screw is missing or my driver is missing I need to go find that I'll be right back um, I will be reshelling this because this is kind of gross uh, but I will be using an OEM shell I found it. It was in the wrong. I put it away in the wrong, uh, the little hole for it. I have an iFixit kit just off the top of my screen here. I don't usually go over this in my videos. Um, I expect most people to be able to f figure it out. Um, don't, don't take that the wrong way. That didn't quite come out right. Um, screw driving is, a, it's pretty easy, but it is a, uh, learned skill. Uh, the Game Boy Advance, if you're using an iFixit kit, uses the Y0 bit and the J0 bit. The J bit is for the um, Phillips screws. They aren't exactly Phillips, they're actually JIS, which isn't quite documented as well as it should be. All right, so this is the Skostank. That's why it was as is. But uh, let's get some tests done. thing is insanely dusty. Forgive me for uh, trying to clean it up here. Okay. Let us get some power usage numbers. Now, most of the tools, a lot of the tools that I use, uh, I do have a link down in the description. This is no uh, exception. This is just a small desktop power supply. Set it to 2.4 volts. Boot it into the same game I always test with at the same location I always test at, which is just outside the Elite Four because of course still haven't beaten this game. I'll get there one day. Um, actually I probably won't at this point because I've used it for testing so much. Playing it on a flash card. Anyway, that's irrelevant. So at 2.4 volts, this Game Boy is pulling about 92 to 94 milliamps, which is pretty typical actually. Um, these things don't pull a lot of power. It's kind of nice. All right. And pull it out. Two more screws. 
Some consoles use three on the inside, but the later model ones, like the 32 pins, all used two. Still have that third screw post though, if you wanted to throw a third one in there. Alright, so the speaker itself is perfectly fine, but I've got a lot of um, magnetic powder stuck to it. Iron fillings, I don't, I don't know what the hell this thing went through. Um, if I had spares, I'd replace it. <laughs> um, no, I'll leave it for now because it does work. But just, just worth considering if you haven't taken your Game Boy apart yet. All right, we want the 32 pin connector. goes in that way and we always want to do a bench test goes in like that, that folds like that and that goes like And there is no soldering required for this kit. I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this. Jam my game in. Connect up the power. And then I'm thinking, I'll just leave that off to the side, and we should be good. There we go. And I need so on the default settings, which doesn't really make too big of a difference with this kit because this kit does remember uh, settings past reboots. So if you set it to high brightness, turn your Game Boy off next time you come on, it should be high brightness still. Uh, and it also has color palettes, which on the Game Boy Advance version, that's not really that compelling a feature in my opinion, but I guess it's nice to have. You don't have to use it. Um, what would be nice would be if they had uh, color filters you could apply that would like increase or decrease the contrast uh, to to more simulate um, I don't want to say an original system because a lot of games have um, colors tweaked to compensate for the original system, so it would be nice to have filters to compensate in the opposite direction since we have access to much better screens now. Anyway, let us take a look at this. It appears, oh dear, I keep hitting both my touch sensors, I don't know which is which. All right, so the long one looks to be the pallets. Set that back to normal. And then the short one is brightness. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine levels of brightness, I think. Sounds about right. Uh, so on low brightness, we're pulling at 2.4 volts, anywhere from 224 to 230 milliamps, which, again, that's pretty on par. Um, I believe it was 94 that it was pulling before this, so, you know, you could do the math on that. It's not exactly linear, but it's still going to be about 45% battery life, so if you were getting 20 hours, you'll get nine plus or minus 
that that's, that's why I, I look at these kinds of numbers here to try and provide that information. Uh, I will go ahead and link that in um, my spreadsheet in the description. I will also measure the screen brightness. Uh, I'm measuring in lux, which is a pretty useless unit, but since everything's measured in lux and I have a few control values in there like um, a stock AGS 101, you can get an idea for, for where we're at. Um, oh, and let's do high brightness. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that is pulling 355 to about 360 milliamps. Okay. And now that we know it works with our bench test, let's go ahead and get this installed. side we shouldn't need it anymore I'm going to disconnect it from here because that'll make handling it easier and they want us to install our insulting film I'm kidding it's insulating film I personally don't see the point in the one that goes on the screen because this board is pretty well protected from shorts. There's nothing on the back here that it could possibly short on. But, rather be safe than sorry, I will not install this one yet because it covers up the connector. And at some point I think I might solder this in. Uh, so yeah, this is the same board base as the TV version. It's even labeled TV version. Uh, again, my understanding was the difference between the non-TV version and the TV version was the non-TV version, you don't get the cable to hook it up, and this chip also isn't there, but it is clearly here on this one, so we'll check that out in a minute. It could be that mine just got mixed up, but we'll see. The install should be identical either way. All right, so instead of putting it back in this gross shell, I am going to be using this slightly less gross shell. This thing still desperately needs a clean, but nowhere near as bad. And yeah, the battery cover is a little bit messed up, but I'll come back and fix that later. And for buttons, I'm going to use these uh, orange-yellow ones that I got from Funny Playing. No reason I can't use the original buttons, but have it apart. They're dropping. Why not? Alright, so onto the screen lens. When I originally did one of these drop-in kits from a uh, manufacturer I refer to as One Chip, um, I did it in this Game Boy, and this is not the lens that I originally had on that Game Boy. You can tell it's the same Game Boy because I messed up that install with the adhesive. But anyway, this has an OEM lens on it because the original lens that I used was this one right here. This is a very old aftermarket lens that I had in my pile of lenses and I wanted to use. At the time, I did not even realize that the printing on the lens was off. So I complained in my last video that uh, the kit was designed to be drop in and didn't come with a lens and you needed a lens. That's not true. That was user error. Kinda. Um, I didn't do anything explicitly wrong but my lens was off center because it was printed off center and you can tell by looking at the inside, you can see on the right side and the bottom, it has a significantly bigger bezel than it does on the top and left. And that is a result of this thing being printed off center. So I should have checked that. 
should have done a better job. And that is why I have this one here. This should be a much better representation of an OEM lens. And if we line that up, you can see, well, it's kind of hard to see because it's on top, but you can see it's not as big a cutout as this one. And that's what we want. And I shouldn't have stuck it down because now it's stuck. There it goes. Save that for something. But anyway, you can use your OEM lens, but if you're dropping in a screen kit, it's a lot easier to pop the lens out for installing the adhesive because how you do it is you just peel the paper off the white side and then just jam it in there and you can push it through and the edge will stick. But mine, I only got the center, so I'm gonna be cutting it out, doing it manually, which in my case would be fine. Another thing, I didn't do this in my last video. In my last video, I it, they called it a drop-in, so I just jammed it in, but that's only half true. For a better install experience, you have to remove, at the very least, these tabs on the right side here. This goes in... We've got this spacer along the bottom here. As you can see, this goes over that bottom tab so you don't have to remove it. And then the spacer in the right here. Goes in between the tab. And then you've got the screen that you install this way. And with this kit, you're supposed to jam it all the way down and to the right. But as you can see, it goes over those tabs. So we're going to remove those because this is an OEM shell and OEM shells have those tabs. You don't have to, but if you don't remove them, then the screen sits at an angle within the shell and it puts it further away from the lens and it's not as good looking. So I'm going to use some flush cutters and uh, I'm going to trim it flush. This seems to be pretty par for the course for most screen mods if you're using an OEM shell. The flusher you get it, the better the result. cutting that bottom tab off just to make it easier with my tools to get the side tab. And so it's a little bit rough. I could come back and clean this up with the Dremel, but it's going to be good enough. Just like that. So now what I want to do though find the adhesive that I just lost. I want to put it down so we can install this. Um, because of who I am as a person, I have no idea where that went, so we're going to use different adhesive. <laughs> oh, jeez. In my defense, though, I have adhesive pre-cut from another project that didn't pan out. That'll go just like that. And I will need to trim this just a little bit.
I'm actually gonna, come on. I'm gonna jam this right in the middle. That way it hits the screen, but is also still hidden behind the bezel. take that bit that I just cut off jam it down here and that is awful convenient that it is almost exactly the right size. That wasn't planned. But what's not convenient is this segue, no I'm kidding. Um, I need another bit for top there. I think I'm going to just leave that out. This is for that other spacer. Something that kind of surprises me that they don't do is there's a lot of extra adhesive left over in the middle punch out. They could have just put adhesive for the two brackets in that middle punch out and you've just got to punch those out further. But I don't know. It is what it is. Alright. So I'm thinking I'm just going to leave that top off. Ah, no, I might as well. What the hell? Might as well do it. I have gotten my mileage out of this roll. This 3M300 LSE stuff the good stuff. They do sell it on AliExpress, but I don't... I think that stuff is of dubious origin. So I'd recommend getting it from a more reliable vendor, such as DigiKey. But it is still pretty darn sticky. Oh shoot, I didn't make it long enough. Oh, and as it turns out, I already had another strip. I just didn't see it back there. Shoot. Oh well. paper on the uh, spacers for no reason other than the side one it's easy to get it in sideways by mistake and actually let's test that um, my concern is the thickness might be different oh I can't get it out now this stuff is a little too sticky Never mind. Eh, I can still try it. And it's about two millimeters thick or tall. And I have to go at an angle, so can't really trust this measurement, but also two, so it's probably fine. 
overabundance of caution. Okay. If you're using the flat adhesive like I am, that absolutely has to be trimmed flush. If it's not flush, you're going to have a hard time. If you're using the adhesive that it comes with, you can, there, there's some leeway in, oh. try not to do that. In. We want it pressed up against both of these spacers, and that should go down just like that. I got extraordinarily lucky with the dust. And then let's drop the screen lens in before I touch it. thing I should do before dropping that in. Oh, that's inconvenient. Oh, it's too late. The screen's already on there. Uh, one thing I should have done was colored the inside of this bezel black. Uh, I've seen people use paint pens for that before. I don't have a paint pen, so I just use a black Sharpie. But there's no reason I can't get a paint pen. Again, because it is a drop-in kit, we will go ahead and use the touch sensors. If I can get the tape off. There we go. So this is actually a capacitance sensor and physically all it is is just a little bit of copper tape soldered to a wire. So if you want to replace this, it's pretty easy to do so if you can solder more copper wire to, or copper tape to a wire. But not everyone has copper tape laying around. twist around on me. All right, there we go. Probably should have checked this before getting this far, but eh, we'll circle back. We'll circle back, it's already too late. I'm going to use the OEM membranes because I don't think I have. Membranes. 
Oh, just kidding. How convenient. Well, it's not quite the right color though. What about these clear ones? That's closer. I think that'll look better. Retro modding sells these. I bought quite a few of them before other manufacturers started selling different colored buttons. Insulative tip. So far, I'm kind of digging it. Start and select are a little bit too late though. I'll have to swap that out at some point. And I'm going to use the original power switch. some batteries in there and I guess I'll just hold that on for now or better yet tape that down and there you go that is looking much better than my last install I haven't even turned the Jesus thing on yet The thing with the screen is it is behind the lens and there's a bit of an air gap and the lens cutout and the screen itself are about the same size so I'm not at the same viewing angle as my camera. When I hold it to where it looks good for me, 
This looks like garbage for the camera. But if I hold it where it looks good for the camera, it looks like garbage for me. So, it looks kind of like that. That's how I see it when I hold it up to the camera. But, when I'm looking at it, it looks great. So I am going to bring this down. And I'm going to try and play through the viewfinder instead. It's not working too well. I have to look at the screen. What I'm looking for right now are any um, any artifacts, screen tearing, frame dropping, stuff like that. I'm not seeing anything. I don't expect to. That sort of stuff hasn't been a problem in a really long time, thankfully. And uh, yeah, not seeing it here now. Cool. So let us get a flash card. A smarter man than I would have this sort of thing already ready. I'm not a smart man. Uh, we want not the aging, not that. We want the 240p. There it is. So with this, we can look at a few things. We can look at the grid and see if there's anything cut off. And as you can see, there's not. Um, it's a little tight, a little tight, but it is all there. And so what I was complaining about last time, that was me hitting the touch sensor. Uh, what I was complaining about last time was, again, that was the result of just a real crappy lens and I didn't realize how bad it was until it was pointed out to me that this kit actually should be perfectly fine. But as you can see with this lens, let me drop it down I guess. I'm gonna regret that in a minute but as you can see with that lens it is cut off but that was a lens problem. All right. I might cut off that color touch sensor, but brightness works fine. That's good. Linearity, it is nice and linear. The point of this test is to see if you get a circle when it displays a circle. If it doesn't, that means your screen is using the wrong aspect ratio for whatever reason. I uh, don't care so much about these other ones. Let's look at the color bars. I think this is a good enough calibration for, I mean, the, those should be pretty standard, so you'll have to, uh, well, I guess at the end of the day you'll have to take my word for it, because my phone is going to be doing some weird color stuff, as well as this screen, as well as the screen that you're watching this on, as well as the YouTube compression, so there's only so much we can do, actually. That's not 100% true. I've got, for calibration purposes, this thing. Kill my desk lights. Just to give this thing a fighting chance. So there is the color profile compared to an AGS-101. This is a stock AGS-101. It's not a backlit, well it is a backlit console. It's not a uh, mod kit or anything, whoops. Um, it's not an aftermarket screen. This is an original AGS-101, not one of the 2018 versions or anything like that. Set to about similar brightness, brightnesses. Um, I don't know that my camera is picking this up all too well, and there's not a whole lot I can do about it, but I will say they do look very similar to me. If we look at this bottom right 
quadrant, I can see that there are three distinct colors on both of these consoles. Uh, after YouTube compression, I'm sure that won't make it through at all. Uh, we have, what, like a dark gray, three color bar, dark gray, and then another dark gray. And on both of these, I can see the difference between those two. This bottom left color looks like a dark blue navy on this console, whereas it looks like a dark gray on this console. It's kind of weird, uh, but it is what it is. Let me grab, also for comparison, an AGS, not an AGS, an IPS, one of the, uh, hang on, let me go, oh wait, no, it's right here. Oh, there's my other batteries. In this console, in this ring, we have a, uh, this is a funny playing IPS kit with one of the 9380 based screens. I don't know whether it is a Topoli or an LG screen in this particular console. And at the end of the day, I don't think that matters. And I won't be able to tell just by looking at it, will I? I have to pop that battery out and maybe I can see it. I can't tell, I can see the ribbon. But it is what it is. Anyway, compare those two side by side. And I'd say the color profile is actually pretty accurate between the two. I, Looking at these two, the contrast on this screen is greater, and personally I think it looks better, but they're real spot on. The biggest difference is the whites. So if we look at this bottom left hand box on the funny playing screen, that looks like pure white to me. Whereas on the drop-in screen, it looks a little bit blue. The camera is picking up very blue, but I promise it looks much less blue in person than it might on the camera. Uh, what else can we check? There was another one. Gray rant now. Color bars on gray, that's it. There's another interesting test because that has a lot more white to it. And I don't know, I guess you're just looking at more whites on whites. Um, it's fine. I My personal opinion is that this screen image is still a little bit better, but this is definitely not bad. The uh, older, the other drop in kits. The, the color accuracy on them seems much more off. Um, specifically, I'm talking about like the Cloud Game Store kits. The color accuracy on those leaves something to be desired. Uh, let me grab one and I'll put it side by side. All right, so this is the not laminated version, I believe. Yeah, this is the not laminated version. I can't believe it took me that long to tell. Uh, of the Cloud Game Store drop-in kit. I don't know, some versions are drop-in, some versions aren't, I can't keep track anymore. Um, I will link that as well. The Game Boy Advance version of the kit uses the exact same LCD. The only difference is installed in the Game Boy Advance SP in this case. Let's go back to this, and we'll put those side by side. And you know, again, it they they both look a little bit off to me. If we look at the blacks, I think that 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 my words, man. Um, does that light help? No, it doesn't. You can sort of see here. Um, if we look at the bottom left-hand corner, this dark blue square looks a lot lighter and a lot lighter blue on the Cloud Game Store kit, which is pretty consistent with my findings with these kits. Um, 
the whites, they're, they're pretty blue on both of them, looking at them side by side. I don't know. I think the biggest difference is that that dark blue down there. If we look at the whites themselves, this one looks like a, a brighter white. This one doesn't look blue per se. It looks kind of gray. It could just be the brightness. Uh, but that that's as bright as this one gets. This is as dark as this one gets. So, yeah, <laughs> um, arguably, again, you know, putting these two side by side, I would pick this one. But that's not to say this one's bad. I just think this one's better. But then, you know, if you want to keep, keep comparing, I still think this one's better than that one. But... What was the other one? Gradient color bars. I suppose this one's pretty nice looking at uh, if, you wanna, if you can see the difference between every single color step. And interestingly, there are more defined steps that I see on this kit for red and green, but blue looks like just a perfect smooth gradient, whereas I see steps with this screen. Yeah? I see. Hmm. I think it's about bedtime. But uh, there you go. I'm, I'm very satisfied with this kit so far. Uh, like I said, holding it side by side with some of the other kits, it's not quite as satisfactory but it's not bad. I just, I keep reiterating because I don't want people to misunderstand, you know, I, it, it's, yes, I'm saying I do like the look of another kit better than I like the look of this kit, but, you know, I'm just, I'm just comparing because I have them all and you guys are going to ask me anyway. It's definitely not bad. And here are the color profiles if you want to see. see as I flip through a few of those uh, you do lose a lot of color data with those profiles so not so useful for Game Boy Advance titles but you know if you're playing a lot of Game Boy Color titles it could be pretty nice um, but otherwise I think that's all I've got the only other tests I have would be da, 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 da. It's not the flash cart. That's not the flash cart. I guess I don't have a flash cart anymore. Oh. It helps if I look in the flash cart container. Let's just quickly run the simple test. Scrolling bars. Just as a double check. Same deal as usual. The S in scrolling, when that crosses the left hand side of the screen, it issues an LCD reset command to the LCD itself, which is going to cause it to stop filling in the frame that it is currently filling in and start working on a new frame immediately. And handles it great. Uh, older kits would give you some pretty nasty screen tearing or they drop quite a few frames. Um, this was a problem specifically more with uh, the Game Boy Color kits, but works out pretty nicely here. Uh, oh, I got the button on that. And let's round off with Zelda here. I think I forgot to do these tests. Some of the other kits. I been, haven't been doing them as much as I should. 
So let's go ahead and look at this. We're looking at two different things here. The first, we're looking at this guy's chain because the original Game Boy didn't have a way to do transparency with sprites. So how they worked around that was because the original Game Boy had a terrible screen, they would just flicker it on and off real quick uh, and that would give you a transparency effect. Not all kits account for this flickering behavior and some of the screens are good enough that you could just see it flickering. I don't know if it's the kit compensating for the flickering or if the screen just has um, worse ghosting than some of the other screens, but the result is the proper display effect. You can still see a little bit of flickering, at least I can in person, I don't know how well it's coming out on camera, but it's way, 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 way better than other kits. The other thing we want to look at is if we go back and forth really quick, uh, the high speed of these logs transitioning over this green, these are like polar opposites of colors, usually results in some uh, ghosting on some of the kits, uh, artifacting rather. And I can kind of sort of see here if I look real closely. I gotta, I gotta look really hard for it, and I can see it, yes, but that is, again, better than some of the 9380 kits. Yeah, I'm really pleased with that. But let's do one more test. One more test, one more test. He always says one more and then he does more than one thing. I'm gonna run Super Mario World because someone mentioned to me that there was a problem Ah, oh, I didn't want to run. Oh, that's fine. I'm just going to run through a level real quick, and we're going to see if there's any artifacting at the end of it. I think I've noticed this with some of the other kits, and I've ignored it because I thought it was a game problem. So let's see if it's a game problem or a kit problem. I should have switched back to Mario. Oops, I messed up. Oh well. Hate playing as Luigi. -a. <laughs> Missed that jump. Let's try it again. Ooh, almost got myself again. Got to switch again. Oh, come on. It's because I'm playing for an audience. This always happens. Oh, again? I won't be able to do the secret ending. I'm short. Are you kidding me? There we go. Alright, now I gotta not eat that football.
didn't see anything there, but I messed that up anyway. Oh. Aha! Did it. I think I gotta do the normal. It's probably a waste of time doing that secret ending. I wish I did it the normal way. Habits die hard. Oh, missed it, but what I was seeing was this like just a pixel of light at the top of the screen flashing across. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I always thought that was a game issue. Someone mentioned that that might be a screen kit thing, and if it is, well, this screen still has that. I don't know if that's a game issue though or a, a screen kit issue or a game issue rather, but I saw it there. Um, there are some other issues I think in the Famicom version, the, like the NES classics of Mario on this kit at least. I don't have that game. I understand I have a flash cart, but I'm not good at that game either. So. I guess I'll have to leave it a mystery. Anyway, uh, I think that's all I've got. Let me um, let me end this here, and uh, I'll catch y'all next time. There will be links in the description. You can check out if you want to grab this kit. I grab, I grabbed it. Um, it was sent to me by Retro Game Repair Shop. Uh, they wanted me to check out the kit, see if I could make a video on it, and give give my two cents. And my two cents is. It's genuinely a good kit. I think calling it drop-in is a bit of a misnomer because it is less drop-in than this kit with one of the aftermarket shells is. You can grab shells for the 9380 kits that already have the cutouts done for you. In fact, you could probably use this particular shell with this kit uh, you might have to trim these out just so you can get the spacer in and get it spaced properly. You might have to trim these out too. The This is an old mold of the 9380 kits. The new mold of the 9380 kits has a few more tabs in there because it is also set to use the ITA kit. So you can use either the 9380 or the ITA and you just have to trim off one tab depending on which kit you're using but the older version is 9380 only I think that would work but you'll have to do a little cutting but as you saw when I cut off that wall you have to do a little bit of cutting anyway if you want to get the install as good as you can get it um, but otherwise you know it's, it's, it's pretty good I didn't do any of the soldering for this. I believe I did in my other video. I would recommend checking out the other. No, I didn't do the soldering for that either. Um, I played off the drop-in aspect. If you want to see the soldering for Game Boy Advance specifically, even though it is for a slightly different kit, uh, I have done videos on these kits. The solder points is the are the exact same. The wire routing is going to be the exact same. The only difference is 
This has one extra solder pad for the AV connector, which for the drop-in, the no TV version, we don't use the AV connector. Whereas for the TV version, we do want to have that soldered up to the link port. But anyway, I'm rambling. Um, I'll catch y'all next time. I will be doing a video pretty soon on this older one that I will possibly swap into this Game Boy just because this install came out so much better. Uh, and then we'll do the uh, TV out wiring. I've got a new capture card on the way, so that's why I was putting that off. Anyway, enough. One more thing, 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 one more thing.